several years ago, almost uh, 15 years ago, uh, a review in one of the American journals of a book on Indian literary theory which uh, raised 11 objections to what that uh, learned gentleman thought was an attempt to revive an obsolete, you know, thought system. Sanskrit uh, theories and uh, because in that article it was claimed that one is talking about Sanskrit theories as an example, literary theories as an example, but what has been said or is being said is about the Sanskrit intellectual systems in all disciplines. So the reviewer thought that this was a vain, fruitless attempt at what he called revivalism. And of course, uh, a rejoinder was written, a long rejoinder, which was published, to which there was no rejoinder, because there couldn't be a rejoinder to a very uh, passionate investigation into the question. The question was, the question is very much alive even today, what is the place of Indian learning, Indian intellectual traditions in uh, primary level universities, in our education system, and ultimately in terms of what it does to the Indian mind, the Indian mind, how we think. And, uh, in 84, 1984, I think, the government of India, the then government of India, in its wisdom, which was a carefully considered policy of alienating the youth, keeping them, you know, ignorant of what they had inherited, could have inherited, their own knowledge, that government decided that Sanskrit will now in the schools, eight and nine, it will be an optional and the students will be asked to choose between Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian, German, French. A school teacher who lost his job as a result of that, he went to the high court he didn't get a favorable judgment, he went to the Supreme Court. And then uh, the Supreme Court, uh, I think Ranganathan Justice was the Chief Justice, some Ranganathan or Rangachari, generally they are Ranganathans or Rangacharis, he was the Chief Justice, and uh, he thought that if he were to take a decision in, in uh, accordance with his conscience, he may not get any commission to head after his retirement. So he passed on the case to a Sardarji, Justice Kuldeep Singh. One of the happiest things to have happened, because Sardarjis do not calculate too far ahead. And uh, Justice Kuldeep Singh accepted that case, gave a date six months later. And in those six months, he read Vedas, he read Upanishads, he read major Shastras, he read accepted authorities about Sanskrit thought, Sanskrit tradition, culture, and then he convened the court. And he started in a very interesting way. The judgment is available on the internet. It's a Supreme Court judgment on Sanskrit, case of Sanskrit. He said that many years ago, it was a judge, it was a judge who declared that Sanskrit was the mother language of all languages. And uh, how many years? Almost 170 years later, 1786 to 19, 1993, uh, almost 200 years later, 
it has again devolved upon a judge to defend it. To defend it. And he said that, that uh, the, a culture, a culture needs to be defended. And in, in to, 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 to support that, he quoted Jawaharlal Nehru, who said that, as long as India has Sanskrit, India is safe, India's culture is safe. And to defend a culture, you need to have, you need to work with a language, which is the language of your culture. culture. And he said, Sanskrit is not just a language. It is the vocabulary of our thought and culture. The vocabulary of our thought and culture. And uh, he went into the uh, arguments of the advocate Mr. Tutsi, and then Milan Banerjee, I think some of us may remember their names, who had argued that uh, how can we teach Sanskrit in that way, we will have to teach Lepcha also. Which he and the and the advocate himself said, many people do not even have not even heard of this language, Lepcha. So Justice Kuldeep Singh asked many very interesting questions. He said, do they teach Sanskrit in Iraq? No. Do they teach Sanskrit in Iran? He said, no. Then why do you feel compelled to teach them along with Sanskrit here? And then he went into the definitions of secularism that were enshrined in an earlier Supreme Court judgment to show and concluded, the conclusion is very meaningful, concluded that therefore teaching Sanskrit without teaching Persian, Arabic, German and French is not against secularism. Now that reminded me that, uh, you know, in Ramayana there is a very interesting episode. Angad, when he goes to Ravan's court, so Ravan tells him that, look, your father was such a strong man, brave man, huh? and because Ravan had been, you know, kept like this by Bali. So, and you are just following this fellow who is an ascetic and in any case he has lost his wife and he is very demoralized and his brother is also demoralized because his brother is demoralized and you have become their follower, what is all this? When he says that, that Angad, you know, forcefully puts his foot on the ground and uh, Ravan almost tumbles and then there is a dialogue in which Angad says, Vachal, Vachal. Is Kadli only a tree? Is Ganga only a river? Is Rama only a Purush? So I thought that since this problem was not there, he would have also added, do you think Sanskrit is only a language? That you can talk about it along with German, French, Lepcha and other things. But the question, why, why till 1950, till 1950, Sanskrit had a, during British period particularly, for all that people say, there were certain very good things about them. Some of them at least were so enamored by Indian thought that they became great students of Indian thought. So till 1950, Sanskrit had a, had a fairly good important place in Indian education. They had introduced the system, Sanskrit will be compulsory in the schools for two years, it will be there as a major subject and you know Calcutta University Department of Sanskrit was one of the major departments of research and great uh, you know scholars, uh, great scholars worked on the primary texts and, and translations and wrote learned treatises on that. It all died. Once we became free, free, what, what do we call independence and what Punjabis call partition, the way, the day we were partitioned, partitioned, you see, one part of our mind, it became more subordinate, more subjugated than it was earlier. And after 1950, the, maybe, sometimes I think, it was a matter of state policy, that if your young people discover their roots, they, they regain their self-respect, you see, and they start walking with erect shoulders, then uh, the political dispensation that is there 
may have to pay a price. So the formula of running the country, they added something to the British formula. The British formula was very simple, divide. And they kept on dividing, dividing further. So the caste and then OBC, then the creamy OBC and then the non-creamy OBC and then they can think of all kinds of layers. They kept on dividing and to that they added, that they added to uh, reorient the education in such a way that uh, the, the young people uh, begin to accept that all the original thinking is done there in the West and that we are merely recipients. They knew because in 1957 a very powerful commission was set up by the government of India to go into the role and status and uh, review of Sanskrit studies in India. It was led by Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, Dandekar was a member, and you can, Dabe was a member. You see, all the big uh, scholars of the time, they were members. And their recommendations are remarkable. In fact, some of us should go to the internet and see those. I say, all that needs to be said and all that needs to be done for Sanskrit was said by them in 1957. All that we need to do today is to pressurize the government to implement their own commission. Nothing new is needed. It is not, there is not time. I could read out the recommendations. You see, what all they said. There is, they left out nothing, virtually. And uh, this was with the support of the constitution. Because remember, in the constituent assembly, two persons had argued for Sanskrit as the national language. Ambedkar, and Tajuddin Ahmed. Very few people know. And who opposed it? Our great friend Jawaharlal Nehru. Not only not Hindi, but English also. You see? And the, this, this is the sad history of why the, the, the kind of the whole thing was derailed. The education was derailed. So they added education to that policy. Now what did they do? They carefully arranged things in such a way, in the name of, you know, again, something they had learned. Macaulay was wise. He connected uh, education with employment, and he connected education with English. So English was connected with employment. And you will agree this is true even today. English is connected with employment. So they, they saw to it that the English language not only continued, but spread wider, thereby creating the two Indias, the other India being larger than the small India which is on the top. By excluding and marginalizing Sanskrit intellectual systems, they transformed a donor, I mean they, they abandoned the donor tradition donor tradition and uh, introduced or effected in practice what I call a Katora culture. You know Katora culture. Mahmood in one of the Hindi films on the river in Singapore singing De 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 Allah Ke Naam De De International Fakir Aay Hai. And you will agree from wheat to every idea we borrowed. And Sanskrit was, Sanskrit is even today a donor tradition. Which books, which books, learned books, learned books are exported most to the European and Western countries? Adi Shankaracharya's commentaries, not Kapil Kapoor's books. Adi Shankaracharya's commentaries. And they are still, you see, the, the seminal Sanskrit texts. Harvard Oriental series, 193 volumes, translations of Indian classical texts. Max Muller series, 53, 54, I am now, don't remember the exact number. At the end of 19th and early 20th century, the West translated the vast Sanskrit knowledge systems into English and into some other European languages later. And, uh, 
enriched them enriched because they you can't you can't fault them this no blame them the entire 19th century europe took to sanskrit studies thanks to darashiko darashiko translated upanishads into persian and one of the translations it went to dupona in france he translated it into french then it went into italian then german and by 1808 1808 all major universities of europe had a chair in sanskrit and they replaced their understanding of hebrew as the source language by sanskrit as the source language and in fact also wound up several departments of arabic in 19th century europe every bright young man was doing sanskrit as our bright young men are doing computer and commerce hmm? to no great effect but still in the hope that one will get a good job a different matter that now a computer it gen- gentleman a boy gets over 2 to 3000 rupees because they are dime a dozen now so they were doing that and you name all the european thinkers nietzsche schiller schelling huh, schopenhauer they were all either sanskritists or students of sanskrit thought as uh, max miller much maligned max miller i don't go with people who you know say he was he was propagating because you see look he, his chair was funded by christian missions and he was naturally they were the employers so once in a while he would write a letter to his mother or something that i am translating the rig veda so that people discover what a stupid book it is huh? so that way i will damage hinduism but look at his translation in fact he revived rig vedic studies in india and uh, in one of my studies uh, articles i call him the 29th vyasa because every time the indian literature was lost through external or internal causes somebody came to recover to retrieve and reconstitute the text because as max miller notes if all the copies of rig veda are lost you can reconstruct the text from the minds of the people because in india in the oral sanskrit tradition sanskrit tradition we have constituted maintained and transmitted knowledge in through the mind and not through external materials like paper or now cds and dvds even cd dvd as some of you we know us know can go bad i mean it's fine and one day you start it just doesn't open but uh, a pandit ji sitting there like our friend alwayar ji you never know what knowledge he has but his knowledge is intact and he will transmit it for 5000 years rig veda has come down intact with not a worm in, in you know out of place while shakespeare's plays composed in the early 16th century in spite of caxton press have yielded to major scholarship modern scholarship textual scholarship is this line by shakespeare is this by marlowe but for 5000 years massive literature all by oral tradition memory mnemonic methods come down intact <coughs> so the sanskrit knowledge culture knowledge culture which has come down to us almost intact was totally excluded and marginalized totally from marginalized and the result is that uh, our education today the young people who come out of the universities and schools at best they are ignorant and at worst they have contempt for themselves kuch nahi hai ji sab bekar hai purani baatein ho gayi hain ab ye इससे अब क्या होगा जमाना बहुत आगे निकल गया है द अदर डे इन दिल्ली आई वॉज इन्वाइटेड बाई आई पी एफ पीपल टू चेयर ए वेयर एवरी लर्नेड प्रोफेसर सेड जमाना बहुत आगे निकल गया है वन मीडिया मैन ऑल्सो एंड ये तो देन आई ट्राई टू शो दैन जमाना कितना आगे निकल गया है 
because I am associated with a rural university in Haryana, sir. You are most welcome. And uh, it is just 100 kilometers from Delhi. It is the other India. You see, I go out in the morning, people greet me, Ram Ram Ji. In Delhi, if I say Ram Ram Ji, somebody will get an FIR done. <laughs> he is a fundamentalist. Everybody says Ram Ram Ji and greets me. In the evening, I go, one day I went. It was late evening and the young drivers of the university vehicles, they used to see me and, and do this. Then one of them came because we were dusky, dusky, you know, and he said, Sir, kaan ja rahe I said, I am going to the chemist outside. Okay, why, you are not well? No, I am okay. My wife needs some medicine. Sir, I will come with you. I said, why? If you don't get it here, I will go and get it from Gohana, 13 kilometers. In Delhi where I stay, I told them, in the same society, for 28 flats, there is a lift. When I enter there, or anybody enter, nobody greets each other. We are enemies because we delay each other by entering the, entering the lift when they were about to press the switch. Huh? They would have gone so much. And now I have held them round, down there. So, zamana bhot aage nikal gaya hai because we have abandoned so many things. We don't, we don't teach our children to value them. We don't value them ourselves. Except perhaps at my age, where it matters, you see, that a young man insists that I take his seat at night in the train, huh? and you see the young man insist, then one's faith in one's own younger generation is also restored, that things are not so bad, see. So, at best ignorant, at worst contempt for themselves, so much ignorance, Pandav ke Pandav ke kitne pete the? Panch pete the. Koon koon se? Ek ta bhima. Ek uska bada bhai. Ek chota bhai. Do ka naam bool gaya. But ask them about Michael Jackson. They'll tell you everything. His children and siblings and so on and so on. This is about the young. What about the intellectuals? So called. You see, intellectuals are translated. In, uh, in buses in Delhi by ordinary people as buddhijivi. Buddhijivis are jo buddhi bech ke jivi ka kamate hai. Hmm? You see, they say that. Ye buddhijivi hai. Ye buddhi bech ke jivi. Isse kuch bhi kehal walo. Hmm? Who pay him some money, he will say what you want to say. He will prove it. Hmm? He will prove it. So buddhijivi hai. Unka kya hua? I, many years ago, these are now, I have been talking about these things for so long that I <coughs> myself become a little tired of these things because it has not made much difference. You see, I used to say de-intellectualization. What has been done by the education is to de-intellectualize India. And uh, because the Indian Academy, it entered into a data theory relationship with the West, what Sar was also saying that we get every theory from there, every concept from there, all logic from there, and uh, we read a paper, something, and then we take our own village and, you know, give the data to say how right this scholar is, hoping that he will catch the eye and make a visit to USA on some pretext. Because for long, so were the values distorted, that the greatest tragedy that could strike our young people was refusal of American visa. Things are changing now. Things are changing now, and not only because of us, but also because of what has happened, what is happening there and elsewhere. But this was the situation. So intellectuals de-intellectualized. A friend of mine, a Sardarji, um, Sardarjis are good friends of mine. I am also half Sardarji from Punjab. <laughs> Uh, professor, he said, you know, Indian intellectual is like the broiler chicken, broiler. You know, a broiler, broiler, beautiful, healthy chicken, white, with red kalgi and you know, they are fed a particular diet to make them fat and huh, so that then they are, you know, eaten. So they look very impressive, very healthy. The problem is they can't stand on their legs. So Indian intellectuals are like broilers. They are fed on a special diet, the Western theory, and they are very impressive because they learn a few words, 
which they smatter in their discourse, like a good housewife smatters the dhaniya and jeera and this, you see, like marginalized, the center doesn't hold, huh? and fundamental and the essentialism, uh, and the, 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 you know, a few more words, I of course, deconstruct, decode, huh? deconstruct, decode. So whatever you are saying, you just throw these words here and there. And you become an impressive broiler chicken. Huh? The only problem is that these people, when they go abroad, many of my students from JNU, they used to take my certification and go and get admissions and fellowship. And then I would immediately get an email, sir, they want me to talk about Indian aesthetics. Can you tell me what should I say? Because they don't know. They want me to talk about Indian philosophy, and they don't know, they didn't know that India had a philosophy or a philosophical system <laughs> to count. So they, they expect them to talk about India, but they know nothing about India, they are broilers. So the education system produced young uh, people with lack of confidence and self-respect and brazenly arrogant, foolish intellectual adults. Brazenly arrogant, you see, again dismissive and all that. They have spread in order to keep this system going so that Sanskrit doesn't get a bigger... I don't mean Sanskrit. You see, I myself am a professor of English and I never studied Sanskrit in school. But by my natural professional, you know, movement, which was, thanks to JNU, possible. JNU, for all its ills, was a remarkable place that it gave complete freedom to the teacher. I could, I, I used to teach Panini's Ashtadhyayi in an MA English program. And Panini's Ashtadhyayi is not taught completely even in Sanskrit departments. But I could do that. So JNU, thanks to JNU, I moved a lot. And I developed my own reading competence in Sanskrit. But when, when I'm talking of Sanskrit, I'm talking of the Sanskrit knowledge, Sanskrit knowledge traditions and knowledge which is there. This is massive. This is massive. I'll come to that a little later. First, this Buddhijivi class, in order to maintain the system, why are they? They feel threatened by this. They feel threatened if it surfaces. You see, linguistics department, uh, I was a very important member of uh, linguistics in India. And I tried to tell my friends that you are mem members of the UGC. Of course, they took care never to make me a member of any committee. Because, uh, you see, I will... Uh, uh, I will disturb the American harmony, the phoneme, the morpheme, the underlying structure, uh, transformation. Because I, I come up with Panini who said there is no transformation, it's only substitution. So the fundamental philosophical differences are there, systems are different. So I told them introduce some Indian linguistics. Because at least in linguistics, you have an attested authority, Panini, everybody accepts, NASA accepts. But no, you, it would, doesn't find a place in any syllabus. Indian In philosophy departments, Indian philosophy departments, you have, say, eight or ten courses, the nine courses are on Western philosophy, and in one course you have half comparison, soul or atma ka comparison karo, atma and soul, compare, and that's done. Indian, Indian philosophy is done, you see, like that. So the, this was sustained, why? Because, as I said, they feel threatened. Because if it comes, it's a, you know, huge, huge uh, textual system. Important thing is that Sanskrit thought systems are textual systems. You have continuous, unbroken, cumulative tradition of texts and thinkers. For example, in grammar, from 7th century BC to 1795, Nagesh Bhatt in Karnataka. Continuous thinking. Continuous thinking and texts of grammar. So if they allow this, a professor of linguistics who has been phonemicizing and morphemicizing for so many years, he will have to shut his shop for some years in order to read these things. So they didn't do it. They felt, as I said, they felt threatened. So they developed all kinds of arguments why Sanskrit or Sanskrit thought should not be given a central place. Now some of those four or five, what, I, what is being said, myths, myths about Sanskrit, I would mention, we all are aware, but I like to mention them. The, first of all, they say Sanskrit was not a spoken language at any time. You must have heard people say that Sanskrit was never a spoken language. 
Now, a language which was not spoken has produced the world's largest body of literature. And epic which is the world's largest and an epic which is metrical. That means an, a, 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 an epic which was recited, which is recitative. Now, how do you recite an epic to people who don't speak the language? How can that happen? Then secondly, the grammar of Sanskrit, Panini's grammar, he doesn't say I'm writing a grammar of Sanskrit. Sanskrit was a name given to the language by Bhas in 5th century. This name is never used. He says, he says, I am writing, in fact, Patanjali explains, he is writing a grammar of bhasha. Bhasha. Bhasha from a bhasha. Bhasha from making noise. You see? And generally the word is used for the barking of dogs. So most of the time when people are talking a language, they are just like doing that. Huh? And then if they are doing something meaningful, then we say vaka. And if they are saying something meaningful in a musical, in an attractive manner, then we say Vani. So Panini is writing a grammar of bhasha. And Vaidiki. Vaidiki means compositional language. So he is writing a grammar of spoken language and a written language. Now what was the point of doing a language of spoken? Because he talks about the pitch levels, he talks about accents, he talk about the pace of speech in his grammar. Now all this applies to spoken language, not written language. So people say this was never spoken language. And thirdly, in Ashtadhyayi, a large section on Sandhi. Sandhi is the first When adjacent sounds are available, they get in the language. Maha Indra, Mahendra, A-E-A. Now this is a phenomena of speech. And a elaborate section on Sandhi in Ashtadhyayi. And yet they say it was never the spoken language. The Valmiki Ramayana is such beautiful recitative poetry. You see, it's recited. Its basic function is to, to, is to be recited. Uh, Indian oral, all these texts are oral. It doesn't matter that you write manuscripts of them or you print a Mahabharat. Mahabharat remains an oral text. Because it is, it is metrical, it is structured, highly structured musically. And portions and parts are recited here and there in folk performances with or without variation. So there is one Ramayana, Valmiki, but there are a thousand Ramakathas, variations, variations. And all the performative literature of India, performative literature of India is links directly to this literature. There is no, in fact, the division between popular and learned is not a real distinction in Indian, in any sphere of culture. So whether it is a dance, in dances, the popular folk dances and the learned dances, the source is the same Natya Shastra, Bharat Muni ka Natya Shastra. So the, uh, this, uh, this is kept out, this is kept out and the myth is that it was not a spoken language. As if, you know, we are speaking wonderful spoken language. The kind of public language India has today, which you see and hear on the television, is a very bad public language. We are now having very bad public language, offensive. While, while Hyun Sang, when he came to India, he leaves a record in his book that the people, of course, about Jalandhar people, you see, in my, I am from Amritsar, 40 kilometers from Jalandhar. Of course, see, the Jalandhar people speak very roughly. They do it even today. The Punjabi is there. So, they because Punjabi language sounds very rough to people who are not used to the language. Of course, to Punjabis it sounds very sweet. Like Tamil, it sounds very rough to Punjabis. But to Tamil people it is very sweet. So, languages have that property. But he says, the moment you cross Yamuna, and you are in the middle of the Asia, the speech is so sweet. Not today. You cross the Yamuna, you go to Ghaziabad, Merat, travel, language is not speech. It has declined, deteriorated. So the public speech, as if we are speaking, so we are going to study the language, and they were not speaking, so we will not study that language. The, uh, and then they, there is, a, in fact, it's a big subject. They say, in fact, there was another language which was the spoken language. 
from which the later languages pali prakrita abhabhranshas arose but they are totally they have no understanding of how the language is developed the the point is that a spoken language produces literature literature which it produces gets frozen the compositional language freezes you get my point for example t s eliot's english you have read eliot's poems huh t s eliot's english do you think people spoke that english no An ordinary english man in london didn't use german words and greek words and learned words and didn't speak in those long sentences and patterns in speech you don't speak like that but can you say that he wrote in a language which was not spoken no he wrote in english which was spoken in those days so every language has a prakrita prakrita that is the natural variety and samskrita samskrita the selected language in which a composer or a writer composes so eliot's english is sanskrit english and it was it is from the prakrit english which was spoken at that time in london that is what holds in indian texts also the vedas were compositional very important knowledge text not sacred because in the hindu traditions there is no sacred text so you can freely burn the vedas tear them no problems in fact because they were opposed and criticized right from the beginning by materialist skeptics the vedas were criticized and from the beginning that's why they have survived because every time some very extraordinary mind criticized the vedas some equally extraordinary mind came up to defend and explain so when kotsa kotsa and other uh, very strong thinkers they said the vedic mantras are meaningless meaningless somebody they say there is one rudra at other point they say a thousand rudras then they say, don't pile fire in the sky they say, what nonsense you can't pile fire in the sky so what is the point of saying don't pile fire in the sky you see or they say they have tautology they have incoherence and they have words which have lost their uh, our clarity because words you know they become opaque after some time they go out of use so then yask 9th century bc uh, from gujarat nagar parkar om paraskaray nama that tradition says he sat down he sat down to answer them that vedic mantras kya ved mantra nirarthak hai he said no no linguistic utterance can be meaningless now this was you know so many centuries before wittgenstein no linguistic meaning can be no linguistic utterance can be meaningless you have to make sense of it so much later our friend chomsky he said green ideas sleep furiously meaningless yes but not to a poet nor to a madman nor to a child for a child also it is very meaningful so you have to make sense they cannot be meaning so the great minds arose just for example he he took up the he took up all the objections don't pile fire in the sky coach said what does it mean proscribing the impossible what is the sense of proscribing the impossible he said well every at least once in her lifetime every young mother tells her infant who can't even turn when she puts the infant down the young mother says don't run away i am coming he says at least once every young mother says this no it's not meaningless she is uh, one it is sheer love she is seeing him grown up and running running and she is expressing her protection for the baby and then she just wants to communicate because the child loves to hear her voice you see so it's not meaningless in the same way proscription of the impossible is not meaningless so like that great minds arose and defended so vedas remain alive even today and with you, you will agree no they don't lack critics and opponents many people say ji padhne nahi dete the us zamane mein which is a doubtful statement adhyayan was never varjit adhyayana recitation was varjit because recitation a really religious ritual required a certain level of competence and for that you had to undergo long training 9 years 10 years 12 years in any case i accept 
कि कुछ लोगों को पढ़ने नहीं देते थे देन आई टेल देम अब पढ़ लो दो सौ रुपए में मिलते हैं अब तो पंडित भी नहीं पढ़ते क्योंकि कठिन बड़े हैं एक लाइन पहली पढ़ ली है ऋग्वेद की समझ ही नहीं आती तो उसके लिए द ट्रेडिशन से चौदह विद्याएं आनी चाहिए छह वेदांग आने चाहिए यू हैव टू बी ए मास्टर ऑफ सिक्स ऑक्सिलरी साइंसेस यू सी ग्रामर फोनेटिक्स एटमोलॉजी सोशोलॉजी एस्ट्रोनॉमी मैथमेटिक्स प्लस द अदर विद्याज वंस यू आर मास्टर ऑफ फोर्टीन यू आर एन अधिकारी देन यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड वेदास चौदह विद्या पढ़ने का टाइम किसको है कोटेशन का जमाना है है ना यूटिलिटेरियन रीडिंग का जमाना है हमारे जमाने में प्रोफेसर एक किताब बताता था हम बड़े ध्यान से उसको पढ़ते थे लाइब्रेरी से जाना जिरोक्सिंग नहीं थी फोटोस्टैट नहीं था सो वी वुड लकी ली वी वुड बुक द बुक बुक बुक्स नीडेड टू बी बुक्ड प्रेस्क्राइब बुक्स तो वो मिलती थी उसको पढ़ते थे एक एक लाइन पढ़ते थे ध्यान से नोट्स लेते थे समझते थे आजकल पाउडरिंग योर नोज है लाइब्रेरी गए कौन सी को एक कोटेशन चाहिए इस पेपर के लिए तो कुछ ले देखा पेड़ निकाला उसको फोटो कॉपी किया या ज्यादा टाइम नहीं है सारी किताब फोटो कॉपी की रख दी हाँ कि फिर पढ़ेंगे सो आवर स्टूडेंट्स हु यूज टू बी ग्रेट रीडर्स दे बिकेम ग्रेट जीरोक्सर्स एंड नाउ दे हैव बिकम ग्रेट स्क्रॉलर्स एंड सर्चर्स है ना सर्च एंड स्क्रोल सर्च एंड स्क्रोल तीन घंटे लग जाते हैं कुछ नहीं मिलता सोचते आज बड़ा काम कर लिया अब कॉफी पीते हैं थक गए <laughs> तो जाए कॉफी पीते हैं सो दिस इट इज इट्स इज गॉन आउट द बुक रीडिंग इज डिफरेंट सो दू डोंट रीड एनी द बुक्स एनी मोर इन द संस्कृत ट्रेडिशन ए बुक हैज टू बी रेड बिकॉज दिस बुक्स आर वेरी स्मॉल यू विल बी अमेज अष्टाध्यायी द ओनली कंप्लीट डिस्क्रिप्टिव रूल बाउंड ग्रामर of a natural human language is composed in 32000 syllables not even words syllables panch page mein chhap jati hai you see so people used to memorize it people used to memorize it at one time they used to memorize with understanding now they memorize as a ritual that's why it doesn't work but otherwise imagine that if you have all the text in your mind which is part of the oral knowledge culture then you are quicker than a computer you know quick a pandit ji traditional pandit ji i met one 86 year old grammarian peri peri surya narayan shastri near tirupati a village and for four hours he sat erect like no water no tea people like me moving after one hour from this side to this huh? and then ko pani chahiye chai chahiye and you ask him anything you ask him even about chomsky's question he would take, he would ask us to explain what is the question and he will give you the answer and he will give the answer from buddhist texts jain texts from grammar from dharma shastras all the wangme he had here the human mind was stretched to its capacity today the human mind is being atrophied to its maximum capacity because even multiplication we put on the outside so my daughter used to say papa what is 5 into 7 i said yaar kamal hai 5 into 7 hum log to 16 into 3 quarter of 15 ka bhi hame aata tha so even today when i go to a shop i am quicker than the shopkeeper in telling what is the total cost दो सौ दो सौ ग्राम टमाटर चार आजकल इतना ही खरीदते हैं दो सौ ग्राम टमाटर बिकॉज दे बिकम सो एक्सपेंसिव सीडीज आर चीपर सो द यू कैलकुलेट फार मोर क्विकली देन दी कैलकुलेटर सो द नॉलेज ट्रेडिशन विच ट्रेन द माइंड ट्रेन द माइंड इट इज इट वॉज थ्रोन आउट एंड द अदर मिथ आई एम मैंशन ओनली वन मैंशन ओनली वन मिथ द सेकेंड वन इज it was the language of invading aryans you know this was put forward at the time when english was being opposed as a foreign language so they came up with the argument that in in a way all languages of india are foreign because uh, south indian dravidian people they were i think they were phoenicians mediterranean 
they settled in Balochistan for some time and there is a Dravidian dialect in Balochistan and then they came here. So they were foreigners. And Sanskrit, the Aryans came, you know, from somewhere where the white people live even today, Caspian Sea, beyond Caspian Sea or the East Europe. And they came here, they brought the language. So it's a foreign language and uh, it's not native to Indians. Now the question is very simple. Two questions. One, they came. The question is, why did they come if they were so learned? As the great literature which is composed. So the answer is, they came because India had good libraries. The invading Aryans came because they wanted to compose great literature in Sanskrit. And for that they needed libraries. And the libraries are only in India. Can there be anything more ridiculous? Secondly, it has been shown there is no linguistic evidence of movement of Sanskrit from, you know, East Europe to India. There are no traces left anywhere. Today English is here. We can say English brought, brought by the English speaking people. And we have the evidence. Because English speaking people are there in England. Even today, they are in America. So English was brought here. But suppose English was here and nowhere else, then what will you say? English was brought by invading uh, Irishmen? You can't say that. So this is the second myth. If by foreigners ka hai, to foreigners ki language hai. So what? So what if English is foreigner? And then the third myth was, that is the language of gods. Hmm? So when in JNU we set up an independent center, so independent center, and I convinced the university to make it separate from the school of languages, autonomous. Hmm? So this, uh, it's a, so this, they asked me why, why you were, uh, why you do this? You see, that separate. I said, you see, this is the language of gods. So how can we be in a school which deals with languages of men? So it's your argument. It's the language of gods. Now. A Maharashtrian, Maharashtrian uh, uh, poet of 1st century AD said, if Sanskrit is language of gods, is Maharashtrian a language of thieves? <laughs> chora? Because in Telugu, for rice is called Chora. Hmm? So Kumaril Bhatt said that he was a Telugu. He said, why should we speak the language of Magadha? Same standard language as Magadha. Because Maghid people, you know, they call rice chora, but chora is, <laughs> they call chor, chor a thief. But we, our word for chor is, rice is chora. So words are different, things are different. So we'll not, this was the debate about what is a standard language, standard Sanskrit. Of course, there can be, Indian, Indian mind has always been against imposing a standard. So all search for a standard Ramayana Katha, standard Mahabharata, authentic, uh, you know, standard of speech. It doesn't apply in a pluralistic country like India. And the next myth that we have here is, again by the Buddhijivis, that it was Brahmanical. This is the most abused idea. The Brahmins. Why? Because the attested three intellectual, collaborative, confrontational schools in India were the Buddhist, Jaina and Brahman Sampradayas, Brahman Sampradaya, Baudh Sampradaya or Jaina Sampradaya. Now everybody read that Brahman as Brahmin, caste, but it's not caste. Brahman Sampradaya is the school of philosophy which operates with the category of Brahma, Brahman, which is written as Brahman and in, in Roman and which is in its, uh, in its, in this, uh, Accusative case, it is Brahman, Brahman, object of. Brahman is the Vedantic category of Brahma. So Brahman Sampradaya, because, and they were also called the grammarians. So they operated with the very Brahma. Brahmanical, Brahmano ka hai, Brahmano ka hai. So I asked one person, Yar Mahabharat Brahmano ka granth hai, kaha ji, aur kis ka hai? To anhi ka Ved Vyas was an illegitimate child, jis ne likha. Brahman chodo, because as far as I understand, caste did not matter. In Rishiyon ki or Nadiyon ka udgam origin koi nahi poochta is desh mein. Ke ye koon hai, jat kya hai, koi nahi poochta. 
पर आप पूछते हो तो हम आपसे पूछते हैं वेद व्यास क्या था वो पराशर ऋषि और सत्यवती डॉटर ऑफ द फिशरमैन इलेजिटिमेट चाइल्ड था एंड द एपिक इज अबाउट द कुरूस डायनेस्टी हाफ इलेजिटिमेट सब नियोग से पैदा हुए बच्चे हैं वो कौन थे ब्राह्मण थे हैज एनी बडी इन महाभारत डिस्क्राइब्ड एनी कैरेक्टर एज ए ब्राह्मीण कैरेक्टर नो है ही नहीं अच्छा ब्राह्मीण डायनेस्टीज इंडिया में कितनी हुई कितने रूलर्स हुए ब्राह्मीण एक शुंग डायनेस्टी एक्सेप्शनल बिकॉज मौर्याज ने इतनी धांधली की 300 साल दैट देर वॉज ए रिएक्शन बट शुंगाज एंड दैट्स ऑल कोई ब्राह्मीण डायनेस्टी नहीं कोई ब्राह्मीण रूलर्स नहीं और इन द लास्ट थाउजेंड ईयर्स द भक्ति पीरियड विच यू नो इन द कोर्ट पीपल आर्ग्यूड दैट बहुत इनजस्टिस हुआ हमारे समाज के साथ इन द लास्ट थाउजेंड ईयर्स द ग्रेटेस्ट भक्ति पोएट्स वर फ्रॉम अदर कास्ट अदर कास्ट एंड नन ऑफ दैम हैज रिटर्न अबाउट कास्ट इन जस्टिस सो दिस होल नोशन ऑफ ब्रह्मेनिकल नीड्स टू बी डिबंकड इन ए फोर्थ राइट मैनर वॉट यू मीन बाई ब्रह्मेनिकल Brahmin by caste? It's not. It cannot be. And then finally, you have uh, this uh, opposition between Sanskrit and Indian languages. Great scholars like uh, our friend Ganesh Devi, that you know, Sanskrit has no connection with Indian languages. So when you point out that uh, in Punjabi, 95 percent of vocabulary is Sanskrit. least in tamil 71% 84% in malayalam 82% in telugu 86% in bengali and assamese how do you explain that they say it is by borrowing you see now if you have any understand you know that you are trying to politically argue something that's all so this notion of no relationship between i give you an example of a dialect of punjabi this is spoken in the area where musharraf ruled near islamabad rawalpindi it is called pothohari dialect dialect of the plateau i am going to speak that punjabi to hum kutr gach se to hum kutr gach se those who know sanskrit don't you know it is sanskrit to hum kutr gach si that is sanskrit and even today they say tamukutar gatsa multani language is half sanskrit even today the siraiki language and there are words in punjabi which are a direct continuity from the rigveda but which are not found in any other indian language so what are they talking that it has no relationship modern indian languages even the i language family business i believe but it has gone beyond the alphabet of indian languages alphabet even Drab- tamil malayal malayalam telugu kannada the alphabet of all indian languages comes from the comes from the map which was prepared in 3rd 4th century bc by katyayana in vajaseni pratishakya he has made a table it is in chomskyan terms it's a very powerful model powerful structure that means every language needs less than what it has so languages choose so some languages have both tata other they make the difference between tata huh? in tamil like sir you know tata ka phase nahi hai hamare yahan hai so languages choose from that template so that is the large template prepared by katyayana and all language alphabets are from their indian languages so these are some of the myths i'll now quickly i think i must but then you call me again later we all have hanuman syndrome you know what is hanuman syndrome hanuman ji lanka mein baithe the na jab sita ko dhoondna tha sab vanar baithe hain hanuman ji piche baithe the aise muh niche karke because jambant was asking kaun jayega sri lanka nobody answering then jambant said ke अब हम बूढ़े हो गए हैं जब जवान थे तो तीन बार आते जाते थे लंका क्यों जाते थे ये नहीं बताया तीन बार आते जाते थे अब जा तो सकते हैं पर वापस नहीं आ सकते तो कोई तो बोलो बट वी इंडियंस हैव दी हैबिट नो बडी वॉलंटियर्स 
except in the grand case of Guru Govind Singh, where he asked for five persons to give their head, give their heads. You know, Panjapyaras and the Khalsa, and the first one was from Odisha, the second one was from Andhra, third one was from Gujarat, fourth one was a jat from Merat, and only the fifth one is a person of my caste from Punjab. And this was being done in Punjab. So Panjapyaras, now they have owned them as their own, but they were all over India because Guru Granth Sahib is in fact India's gift to Punjab because the Bani of so many saints is part of that text. So the Indians don't volunteer. So Jamwan said, Hanuman, you get up. Why are you silent? Do you know? Have you forgotten what your strength is? And then he reminded him. Because he was cursed. When he was small, he used to throw the rishis in the Ganga. So the rishis cursed him. You forget your strength till somebody reminds you. And then Jamant reminded him. And then Hanuman grew. So we are all Indians suffering from the Hanuman syndrome. We have forgotten what our strength is. And don't value it. But the value is immense. As Sir said, you see people are working here and there in all their own different ways. And India is like an ocean. In the ocean, there are so many waves. And you never know what will be the shape of the surface after some time. So in the same way, India is a self-governing country. It works in spite of the government and in spite of the organized systems. People dynamism, people's dynamism drives it. And things are happening all over. 30 years ago, when I started talking of these things, 35 years ago, people in 1974, people used to walk out of my lectures. They used to say, this is all absolute, this is Sanskritization, new knowledge has taken its place. But today, even the Marxist states and universities want to hear these things. So things are changing, things are bad. Dharampalji should not have been gone into such depression. Because things are happening. They don't appear to be happening. But as I said, it's like the ocean. Someday it will show. Well, thank you very much. I'll stop here.